Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, I thought this one looked like some fun. Uh, it's been a little while since we visited our friend Griffin over at the Armchair Historian. So uh, we're going to take a look at his video today on muskets to machine guns, the evolution of weapons from 1837 to 1901. Now I'm assuming that the reason he has chosen those dates is those are the exact beginning and end dates of Queen Victoria's reign. So that's the Victorian era, as we call it. So I'm guessing that's why he chose those dates. I don't know for sure. Uh, but I thought it'd be interesting, give us something good to talk about. As always, the link is in the description to the original content. I'll also uh, put a link up at the end uh, so you can check out the playlist of my other reactions to his videos in the past. Let's go ahead and dive in. Griffin Johnson, the armchair historian. Few inventions have had as great an impact on human history as firearms. And few inventions have had as great an impact on firearms as industrialization. Before the 19th century, firearms were crafted by individual gunsmiths, each pistol or musket a unique work. With the introduction Yeah, that's true. And uh, in fact, even into the 19th century, my fourth great-grandfather was a gunsmith in the jewelry quarter in Birmingham in the West Midlands of England. Uh, and I know there were a lot of gunsmiths in that area. So it wasn't like it was on an industrialized scale with big factories. It was a bunch of, like there were dozens and dozens of smaller local guys who handcrafted these weapons. Production of factories and mass production, guns could be made in unprecedented numbers. And when paired with the burgeoning fields of chemistry and metallurgy, mm -hmm. a new chapter in military history was opened. In this video, we will look at the evolution of firearms throughout the 19th century, examining how individually made muskets evolved into mass-produced rifles, and how the firepower of massed infantry was concentrated in terrifying new weapons like the Gatling gun. Prior to the 19th century, the only commonly available form of chemical propellant was black powder, made with a simple mixture of sulfur, carbon, and potassium nitrate. Despite its usefulness on the battlefield, black powder was actually a low explosive, burning slower than the speed of sound and producing large amounts of chemical byproducts in the form of smoke and fouling. And that's why up to just past the time of the American Civil War, uh, battlefields were really smoky. And that, that's a big factor in battles is after a couple of volleys, you know, you can't see a darn thing on the battlefield, especially if the wind's not blowing much. Uh, of course, so the invention of smokeless powder was a revolutionary thing. Uh, and also when he talked about potassium nitrate and some of the stuff that gunpowder is made of, uh, some of that stuff was sometimes hard to come by. And so, for example, you would have um, you would have Southern women uh, during the Civil War who actually helped by donating their urine for use in the process of creating gunpowder. Black powder also required a source of ignition to start burning, meaning there was no practical way to design a firearm without including a cumbersome mechanism like a flintlock to generate a spark. But at the dawn of the 18th century, a British nobleman called Edward Charles Howard made a discovery that would shake the world to its core, fulminates. High explosive compounds that could be detonated by heat or pressure. Suddenly, a whole new world of destructive potential had been unlocked, breaking a technological barrier that had stood for more than 600 years. Gunsmith kind of a cool thing here because you see on the right that's i think that's inspired by breaking bad there's a scene in breaking bad where he makes a crystal that the guy thinks is meth but it's actually a form of fulminate and he throws it and when it hits the ground it explodes so the the modern idea between how or concerning how guns work right is that you have you have a bullet that's got a metal casing and you've got a hammer that hits that uh, back of that casing and, and that pressure, that, that quick pressure right there, uh, using the firing pin is what's gonna make the bullet fire, but that wasn't how it was before that. This quickly saw the potential in fulminates leading to the patenting of the percussion cap in 1822 by American inventor Joshua Shaw. 
This was a simple metal cylinder containing a speck of mercury fulminate detonated by the impact of a striking mechanism, generating a controlled explosion to ignite the powder charge of a loaded firearm. But European armies were hesitant to take advantage of the percussion cap, and though many trials were conducted, it was not until the 1840s that the widespread replacement of the flintlock began in earnest. So basically then what you have is by the time of the American Civil War, for example, these, uh, these percussion cap weapons, uh, your process involves you've got a bullet, um, a projectile of some kind with a paper cartridge that has powder in it. You're pouring, you're biting off the end of the paper cartridge. You're pouring the powder down into the weapon. You're going to use a ramrod to ram the bullet all the way down to the bottom. And then you're going to put that cap on out of your uh, cartridge box or you got a cartridge box for your bullets and then you have a box for your caps you put your pack cap on you pull it back and you pull the trigger and it triggers that cap and then fires the the bullet one of the first conflicts that proved the value of the percussion cap musket or cap lock was the mexican-american war Though U.S. forces began the war using Model 1816 smoothbore flintlock muskets, various armories had already started mass converting these obsolete weapons into cap locks. American gunsmith Samuel Colt had also patented the first cap and ball revolver in 1836, which became highly sought after by any U.S. soldier able to afford one. Yep. Why would that be highly sought after? Because if you're reloading a weapon that even on the best case scenario on the battlefield takes you 20 to 30 seconds to reload uh, you are vulnerable during that time so if you have got a weapon that can fire multiple shots without having to quickly go through that process of reloading you're much less vulnerable on the battlefield so you're desperate to get your hands on something like that if you can afford it most iconic of all was the legendary 1847 Colt Walker single action revolver, specifically procured by Texas Rangers after earlier designs failed to meet their expectations. Known as the gun that won the West, the Colt Walker could fire 6.44 caliber bullets before needing to be reloaded, and was considered one of the most powerful handguns in the world until the 1930s. Mexico, meanwhile, was forced to rely on imports of British brown bess flintlock muskets and lacked the domestic gun industry needed to refurbish these old weapons up to modern standards. Think about this, the brown bess 1722, it's already 50 years old by the time the American Revolution comes along. Now granted, they've probably made some upgrades to it and things like that, but the basic technology is the same. Uh, so. What we're going to see starting in the 1840s, moving all the way up through, say, the First World War, is a huge technological leap forward in weapons, especially right at the end of the Civil War when you start developing the early form of a machine gun. Back in Europe, the period of relative peace following the end of the Napoleonic Wars ended abruptly with the outbreak of the Crimean War in 1853, widely regarded as the first truly modern war. By this point, most nations had begun issuing cap lock muskets as their standard infantry weapon, and rifled barrels were starting to become commonplace. But soldiers were still exclusively using muzzle loaded guns, with powder and bullets inserted via the end of the muzzle and pushed down using a ramrod. So muzzle loader means exactly what it says it is. You load it from that and well, that takes longer, right? You gotta take the time to put your gun down, do this. So a breech loader, which in other words comes in from the backside is gonna be much faster just because you can continue to hold your weapon facing the enemy while you reload. That's a much quicker process. But there's also a really important development that happens uh, in the 1850s where you're switching over from a round projectile, you know, because he talked about rifles, right? So smooth, smooth bore is exactly what it says, a smooth bore. A rifle has, that, has those grooves that turn, right? So, so when you fire, it's going to spin. And just simple science, if something's spinning as it flies through the air, it's going to stay much more accurate. Uh, so then they develop what we call the mini ball, which isn't a mini or isn't a ball at all. 
Uh, and, and that's the, the bullet that we are familiar with from the American Civil War, the, the one that's got the rings at the bottom. And they're still really soft because they're made of lead. But those are incredibly accurate. When using those with a rifled gun, uh, you are going to have tremendous accuracy. And that's one of the reasons why we see such deadly battles in the American Civil War and then in the Franco-Prussian War that follows. This imposed serious limitations on both accuracy and rates of fire. Lead shot would rattle around inside the barrel of a smoothbore musket, greatly reducing accuracy. Rifled barrels were designed to grip a bullet tightly and spin it, but these spiral grooves meant that muzzle loading required violently hammering the bullet down with a ramrod. Many potential- But you can't just drop the bullet in and have it go down to the bottom, right? Because it's got to be tight. That's the whole point. It's got to be tight enough to be able to spin that projectile. That's why you had to ram it down. Solutions to this problem had been proposed, but it was not until just before the Crimean War that a breakthrough occurred. There's the mini ball. In 1849, two French army captains named Claude Etienne Minier and Henri Gustave Delvinia had invented the Minier ball, a cylindrical bullet. And he's right, it is pronounced Minier because it's French, but everybody calls it the mini ball. With etched rings and a conical indentation at its base. When fired, hot gases pushed the thin lead walls of this indentation outwards, engaging the rifling and creating a hard seal with chamber walls. Within four years, the French army had adopted the pattern Minier 1851 rifle and licensed the technology to the British, who implemented it in the form of the P-51 and P-53 Enfields. Although some- A lot of which got used in the Civil War because they were exported by the British. Older models were still in use. The Minier rifles were a powerful force multiplier on the battlefields of Crimea, being some of the very first guns to successfully combine high accuracy and long range with a high rate of yep. fire in an affordable package. And right at that point then is when the strategy of having men stand shoulder to shoulder in long lines and coming up at close range to fire is obsolete. But it's gonna take a while now for the tactics to adjust uh, to the new technology. But while the Minier rifle was undoubtedly one of the most advanced mass-produced firearms of its time, it would soon be superseded by breech-loading rifles. Breech-loading guns could fire faster than any muzzle loader, but were subject to their own suite of issues. The worst was that of hot gases escaping from the breech during powder ignition, lowering projectile velocity and potentially burning the shooter's face if firing from the shoulder. Because normally you don't have that extra place that gases can escape from in the rear. The Norwegian army was one of the first European powers to adopt a really? breech-loading rifle as its standard infantry weapon in the form of the M1842 Kammerlader, which used a unique crank-operated mechanism to tightly seal the breech prior to firing. So I learned something here. I didn't know that as early as 1842 the breech-loaders were being used. I thought this was more of a kind of 1870-ish type thing. Well, I shouldn't say that, because in the American Civil War, they started to use repeating rifles that were breech loaders. Although the Kammerlader was an excellent design, the thick, heavy breech mechanism was destined for obsolescence as the science of metallurgy advanced in leaps and bounds throughout the long 19th century. While the great powers of Europe were busy with the Crimean War, the Kingdom of Prussia was busy looking to leapfrog ahead of its competitors by adopting the breech-loading Zundnadelgewehr, or needle gun. ignition rifle, otherwise known as the Dresa needle gun. Initially prototyped by Johann Niklaus von Dresa in absolutely revolutionary weapon right here. In the 1820s, the needle gun used an innovative new bolt action mechanism that made it easy to load and fire in any position. Instead of using a hammer or serpentine, pulling the trigger caused a sharp metal needle to punch through the paper cartridge in the breech and detonate the percussion cap, hence the term needle gun. 
The bolt action mechanism was lightweight, and the entire weapon could be easily field stripped in the heat of battle, allowing for the rapid replacement of damaged parts. Huh. This was an important addition, as Drace's design was at the bleeding edge of firearms technology. And at that point, then you need to be able to mass produce those parts, right? So that you can have those extra parts on hand. But being able to mass produce also means you can mass produce the weapons. The needle was the most commonly replaced part of the mechanism, and the imperfect gas seal lowered overall performance. Nonetheless, the benefits of the needle gun vastly outweighed its early problems, and following the Crimean War, most European nations would adapt the design and bolt action features for their own standard infantry rifles. At this point, I'd like to take a brief moment to discuss some of the important considerations commanders of the day had when it came to new firearms. By far, the biggest was logistics. Infantry rifles needed to be cheap and easy to mass produce. Yeah. Prior to the invention of steel casing in the mid-1800s, firearms were hand-tooled, relying on skilled gunsmiths to produce consistent results. But even after the advent of mass production, military thinkers preferred to rely on centuries-old tactics. Conscript armies marched in massed formations, so the need for individual firepower was de-emphasized. So that's why you start to see, with the American Civil War, with World War I, etc., you see these massive casualties that dwarf what has come before in these Western nations' uh, armies uh, in their in their wars, because the the tactics always seem to be lagging behind the technology, because the technology is is advancing so quickly now. You know, we've seen it in our own lives, right? How quickly technology is changing. Uh, technology moves so much slower for so much of human history that human history was able to adapt and the armies were able to adapt and the tactics adapted, but now it's happening so fast that you just can't keep up. More complex guns meant more training, making soldiers harder to replace. For many nations, it was simply easier to rely on quantity over quality. Yep. A great illustration of how quickly firearms evolved during the latter half of the long 19th century is found in the American Civil War and the Spencer Repeating Rifle used by some Union cavalry regiments. The Spencer Repeating Rifle was among the first ever magazine-fed rifles adopted into military service, and one of the first to use both a lever action mechanism and a metallic cartridge. Spencer rifles had a tubular opening bored through the buttstock, into which up to seven cartridges could be inserted nose first. Lowering the lever allowed a spring to push a cartridge into the receiver, while raising it chambered the round, leaving only the hammer needing to be cocked before the rifle was ready to fire. This meant a Spencer repeater could empty its seven round magazine in less than 15 seconds to Confederate troops still using mostly muzzle loaders like the Enfield Pattern 1853, encounters with Union cavalry armed with Spencer repeaters were utterly devastating, with a half dozen mounted troops easily able to dismount and match the firepower of a whole platoon armed with cap locks. Okay, so one thing we have to mention with this though, there's a drawback to that, right? Which is how quickly you run out of ammunition. Yes, you could, in a short engagement, you could hold off a much larger force because you can load, you know, the, the joke by the Confederates was that they could load on Sunday, uh, the Union Cavalry could load on Sunday and shoot all week because they could put in seven at one time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you still have to be able to carry that. So it's not like you can do that and you can fire 300 rounds without having to go back and get more ammunition. So you've got to be able to supply these guys or they've got to be able to use it sparingly. Uh, so ammunition is going to be an issue. Another secret to the success of the Spencer Repeater was its use of a metal cartridge, the first prototypes of which had been created all the way back in 1808 by Swiss gunsmith Jean Samuel Pauli. Prior to his work, paper cartridges containing bullet, powder charge, and primer had been common, but metal cartridges protected their contents from the elements much better, yep. and created a natural seal against gas leakage. 
One of the first commercially successful firearms using metal cartridges was the Model 1 revolver released by the Smith & Wesson Company in 1857, which used .22 rimfire ammunition, where the primer was contained in a small metal lip around the rear wall of the casing. The Spencer Repeater also used a rimfire cartridge, but even by the 1860s, gunsmiths were transitioning to centerfire rounds, with the primer located in a recessed cup at the base of the round. This Basically the exact same concept as the percussion cap, but now the percussion cap's built directly into the cartridge rather than a separate thing that has to be done in the loading process. Enabled much higher powder loads, allowing metallic cartridges to be scaled up to rifle calibers. Though weapons like the Spencer Repeater made a dramatic entry onto the world stage, they would soon be overshadowed yeah, by something bigger still, something that would change the face of warfare forever. That something was the Gatling gun, designed by Richard Jordan Gatling and patented in 1861. Now you might ask yourself, well, wait a second, if it was patented in 1861, why did it barely see any use in the American Civil War? Well, patenting something and making it viable on the battlefield and making it mass produced enough to be able to be used is a totally different story. A great example of the lag between an invention and its practicality is the plasma TV. I've mentioned this before, but I can remember as a child in the 80s when my grandfather was a TV repairman, he told me about this new technology where you'd have a TV, you'd be able to hang on your wall. The plasma TV was actually invented in 1964. And we don't even use plasma TVs now. Now we're up to LEDs, but uh, plasma was one of the early technologies that people bought. Uh, but yeah, it took from 1964 till what, late 90s before you really started seeing it practical to the point where it could be bought. And look at the difference between how much people paid for flat screen TVs 20 years ago compared to what they are today. Once the technology is commercially available, then there's another lag between when it's available and when it's cheap enough to be affordable for most people. With an innovative hand-cranked mechanism that rotated six barrels around a central shaft and loaded them individually from a steel cylinder filled with paper cartridges, the Gatling gun was capable of firing not just dozens, but hundreds of rounds per minute. Contemporary designs like the French mitrailleuse and Union Eger gun also existed, but came with severe drawbacks. The mitrailleuse only fired a single shot from each of its dozen barrels before needing to be reloaded, making for tremendous volleys but poor sustained firepower. The Eger gun, meanwhile, used a complex revolver mechanism that was taxing to operate and its single barrel rapidly overheated. And that's an issue that machine guns are gonna have and you're going to have to be dealt with and you're going to come up with ideas like doing burst fire rather than just continual fire or you're going to get water cooling mechanisms, air cooling mechanisms. The Gatling gun was the design that bridged the gap between the repeating firearm and the artillery piece, being a crew served weapon designated to engage enemy forces with continuous direct fire using rifle caliber ammunition. Astonishingly though, the first Gatling guns were regarded as almost useless by both Union and Confederate generals. And in the aftermath too, George Armstrong Custer had Gatling guns at his disposal going into the campaign that would result in his death at Little Bighorn, but he didn't consider them to be worth the trouble of having to bring them along for long distances. Given their propensity for jamming and the vast clouds of powder smoke they generated, Richard Gatling was forced to take his design overseas, resulting in the Gatling gun quickly becoming the weapon of choice for European militaries looking for more concentrated firepower against large armies of native troops in Africa and other colonial territories. In 1870, Maxim. the Franco-Prussian War pitted German troops armed with Dresa needle guns against French infantry armed with Chassepot rifles. Though Prussian artillery and tactics would quickly rout the French army, the newer Chaspo proved superior to the Dresa, featuring a superior gas seal and faster projectiles that caused enormous wounds at much longer ranges. Mm. 
Realizing they were at a disadvantage, the Germans urgently began seeking a replacement rifle after the war ended. The Mauser company stepped up to the challenge with the Mauser Model 1871, a bolt-action design that proved far more robust than the delicate needle gun. Gewehr, By that's now, a name the you're gonna age hear later. of single-shot rifles was quickly coming to an end, and in 1884, Mauser's design was updated to become one of the first standard-issue infantry long arms with a magazine similar to that of the Spencer Repeater. Soon after, British-Canadian gunsmith James Paris Lee perfected an integral box magazine fed by stripper clips. But single shot guns were not- You'll notice all these names sound familiar, right? Mauser and Gewehr and Lee for the Lee Enfield rifle. These are the names that we know from the modern wars. Not obsolete yet. And designs like the Martini Henry rifle proved the perfect weapon for British troops operating all across their vast empire. Now Martini Henry is a breech loader, right? And that gives them a big advantage when they get into things like the Zulu War. In such remote territories, ammunition supply was a huge factor, and as ammunition grew more complicated, so too did the cost of shipping it out to the troops. This was also a drawback for guns like the Chaspo, whose rounds cost twice as much and were twice as hard to make as the simpler Dresa cartridges. Though many officers saw the potential of rapid firing guns, they also recognized that their introduction would triple any military budget overnight and create new supply chain issues that would take decades to fully address. And this is a huge issue throughout World War I, right? Is the massive amount of supplies that have to be brought to the front in order to keep an army going, especially where artillery is concerned and when you're expending a lot of ammunition for machine guns. The 1880s would see two more giant leaps forward in firearms technology. The first came thanks to the work of British inventor Sir Frederick Abel, who patented a smokeless propellant known as cordite in 1889. Cordite was a mixture of newly discovered chemicals such as nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin that burned far more cleanly and efficiently than black powder. Smokeless the powder. patenting of cordite and other similar formulas solved the issues of barrel fouling and excess smoke production, meaning that it was weapons like the Gatling gun which saw the largest benefits. While the idea of using the recoil of a discharging firearm to cycle the action and chamber a new round had existed since the 1870s, it was the work of British-American Hiram Stevens Maxim, Maxim. that created the go. world's first automatic weapon in 1884, the Maxim gun. With a single barrel encased in a water-filled jacket, the Maxim gun was relatively lightweight at around 60 pounds and could be operated by one man using a collapsible tripod, making it infinitely more portable than a carriage-mounted 170-pound Gatling gun. Much like its older counterpart, the Maxim gun was first employed by the colonial powers during the scramble for Africa. But with the advent of smokeless powder, the frequent jamming issues that plagued both rotary and automatic weapons finally became a thing of the past. And, and why does that happen? Because if you have smoke, then that smoke's leaving a residue, right? And that residue is what's fouling up your guns. The Maxim gun was soon being bought by many European powers, ushering in the age of the machine gun. While previous inventions like the repeating rifle had shown the obsolescence of Napoleonic era tactics, it was the machine gun that would finally destroy all vestiges of the military status quo that had dominated Europe since the invention of the musket. But we see tactics in World War I still not quite there, right? Because you got these machine guns mowing down huge numbers of people, though it's not machine guns, but artillery that is the deadliest thing on a World War I battlefield. As the long 19th century drew to a close, the arms race between nations only intensified. In the span of about 70 years, militaries had gone from using muzzle-loaded smoothbore muskets with an effective range of less than 50 meters to magazine-fed rifles that could land a bullseye over 600 meters. And machine guns were quickly coming to dominate the battlefield. Unfortunately, history has taught us that doctrine marches one step behind technology. 
Yep. During the Great War, generals convinced they could replicate the lightning advances of the Franco-Prussian War through thousands of men equipped with bolt-action rifles against entrenched machine gun positions. And this is a problem all the time, right? Because the men who are your lieutenants and captains in one war are then your generals in the next war. And so they tend to go with what works. Think about your own life, right? We tend to, in like, it's certainly true in my case, the music that I enjoy the most is the music of 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when I was a teenager, when I was in my early 20s. That's kind of where I'm stuck as far as the music that I like. And I think a lot of people would probably say the same thing. Uh, the same thing's true here. The, the guys who fought in the Mexican War and who were trained on Napoleonic tactics are the generals in the American Civil War using those tactics with vastly different weapons. The guys who were the young officers in the Franco-Prussian War are the generals in the First World War. Resulting in unspeakable losses. But even this deadlock did not last for long, as even more advanced weapons, like tanks and improved artillery, would eventually break these defensive and lines power. and render them obsolete as well. If you want to experience... So that was good. And uh, yeah, his game's really fun too. So check that out. Um, Fire and Maneuver is what it's called. But I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. If you have another one of his videos you'd like to recommend to me and have me t uh, check out sometime, let me know in the comment section below. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.